All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another very nice, although today a little bit rainy, arc, uh, morning in Northwest Arkansas. Um, I'm Rani Jan. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor at the University of Arkansas and uh, Director of the Institute for Integrative and Innovative Research. It is a great day today, but let me first start. It is a Staff Appreciation Week. So I will start with thanking all our staff that have been fantastic, not just today, but yeah. Um, welcome members of Zoom. We have a fantastic panel to uh, move us forward. And I anything about the panel, Philip Sambo will. <laughs> but I'll take a, uh, just a, a minute to tell you about the Institute. We are still newbies. So it's uh, still trying to get everybody socialized to who we are. Um, we are an um, Institute at the University of Arkansas formed by a transformational gift from the Walton Family Charitable Support Foundation as you might have heard of the name, Institute for Integrative and Innovative Research, we go by I cubed R and the cube on our logo uh, uh, that associated with it. Uh, we have said that we are going to take on wicked problems. And there are five words that define kind of our mission and vision. One is convergence. And what, and that, and what we mean by convergence is convergence across sectors, not just within academia, but industry, nonprofit, for profits, government sectors. So bringing all of those together in order to be able to address problems, find solutions, so convergence. Second thing is taking on grand challenges. So as an institute that cuts across the entire university and that was formed with a very specific mission of also supporting economic development within the region and then going beyond, that, that makes sense for us to be thinking about taking on big grand challenge problems. Then we talk about innovation and then economic development, obviously. And finally, making sure that whatever we do can be moved to be at scale so that we are not just stuck in the lab or not just stuck at being able to put a patent or a license out, but that we actually get things deployed. And for that, you know that we cannot get things deployed by just one group. You need a whole team, you need all of the ecosystems to work together. So back again to the convergence and our purpose, we say we are driven by purpose and our purpose is societal impact. So with that, what is our big grand challenge that we pick? We pick integrative health. And there is somebody here who would know exactly what we mean by that. <laughs> you know, so but when we define integrative health, it's not just about health, right? It's also about the socioeconomic situation. It is physiology, it is a socioeconomic uh, status. It is also structural situations, policies, and et cetera, that happen around it. And what are two sectors that really have to really intertwine food and health? Those completely become, of course, all kinds of cyber operations, safety and security of data and devices and the supply chain. All of that has to be looked together. So what did we think we should do? Of course, we want experts to come in, but we need conversations. We need conversations conversations that bring things together. So I am delighted that today we have our second conversation panel and related to food and health and, uh, and sensing of that and behavior in it and all of that tied together. So looking forward to a dialogue, conversations, challenges, all of that put together. And with that, I will introduce Philip Sambal. Philip is our project manager, comes with extensive experience in Washington, D.C. before he landed here. And he has been, um, you know, helping channel many of our pro programs around the food and even health areas together. So, Philip, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Jung. And, and thanks, everyone, for being here in person and to our Zoom audience for joining us online. Um, we've got a great panel today where we'll talk about the food and well-being connection. Uh, the old saying, you are what you eat, uh, is, is very true. But, uh, you know, what we eat and uh, our uh, ability to obtain that food uh, is influenced by a variety of factors, uh, many of which we'll talk about today. So uh, without further ado, we'll introduce our panel and I'll give them a moment to uh, talk about their work uh, and, and why they're here today. We'll start uh, with Dr. Angela Pierce. Angela, would you introduce yourself and, and your work at uh, uh, the Alice Walton School of Medicine? 
Sure. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be here on this beautiful day. It's a little overcast <laughs> and rainy, but I think it's beautiful. October is my favorite month. Mm. Um, so my name is Angela Pierce. I am serving as the Assistant Dean of Whole Health Integration at the Alice L. Walton School of Medicine. So what that means is I am working on uh, collaboration with other areas of our curricular leadership to integrate smoothly and comprehensively various whole health approaches to treating patients, to managing care and bringing awareness not only to that aspect of medical education, but also training our student doctors how to manage health for themselves and promote their own self-care so that they can go on and serve their for a, a long and healthy career. Thanks very much. And uh, Dr. Sia, would yeah. you mind introducing yourself and, and your work here at the university? Yeah, sure. Uh, Hello, my name is Han Sok So. I'm a professor of sensory and consumer science uh, in the Department of Food Science at the University of Arkansas Fayette. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, this interesting uh, IQR uh, CIPIC series uh, in the beautiful uh, weather and beautiful <laughs> building. <laughs> yes, so this is my great honor and pleasure. So um, actually, my life goal is to improve uh, to provide some contribution to creating some society uh, where everyone can be happy. Okay, so I wonder how to improve everyone's happiness. So I wonder. I I just cast. I just uh, give a question to many many people. So I can give some question to you. So what makes you happy? Maybe flaws. Love. 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 Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. Coffee. <laughs> okay. Yes, okay. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Touching more lives. Oh. Making the whole. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much for your answer. So from my uh, experiences and also the from the colleagues and friends, the families. So many people they uh, enjoy the moment of happiness while they are eating taste food with uh, their favorite people with under very uh, pleasant environment. So that means we need to consider the aspect, food and consumer and also interface. So that's why I approach a holistic way, a holistic way to improve uh, our quality of life and to improve our happiness by uh, optimizing sensory components that induce uh, happy, healthy, sustainable, and smart behavior. So in the context of consumer food and interface. Okay? So that is my main research and my goal for my research program. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah. And Emmanuel, would you introduce yep. yourself and uh, in that rope swing? Yep. My name is Emmanuel Gardenier, in the Rope Swing Hospitality Group. We are a group of uh, eight restaurants and we're expanding. We have other hospitality projects. And one of our main mission when we opened was to help the ecosystem of Bentonville to grow and to attract more restaurants. So we started to open restaurants and basically bring people downtown and grow. Uh, now our mission is slightly different because we, we do have a lot of things going on in Bentonville. And we are more gearing towards a healthier path or connecting the farmers to the hospitality and the restaurants. Um, more refined cooking by going down to the original ingredients, seasonality. Uh, so, so we're kind of taking a little old school approach of uh, using the seasons, using what's coming, uh, talking to the farmers, going to see how the beefs are here. Uh, not mentioning the chicken because in Arkansas, well, that's a given. But uh, <laughs> the the main approach is we are definitely have a mission to improve the global Bentonville ecosystem. So some of our partners uh, work on the bike, like bike path and the sports aspect of Bentonville. And we are more into the healthier approach to the food and trying to work with the local uh, culinary school to improve the uh, teaching, but also to give a path to those uh, people uh, the students into hospitality, but pushing really hard to get 
much better products, much healthier, uh, and met cooking methods that are actually making sense for the product too. Um, so this is what, what we're trying to do. Thank you. So everyone here is working in one way or another in making healthier food more available. I think a lot of this is driven um, by the public health uh, uh, you know, statistics that we've seen um, in, in recent years, obesity of rates over 40% nationally. Um, and so you're starting to see, particularly with younger people, that push and drive to, to eat healthier. Um, one of the, the big changes, I think, is food is medicine initiatives um, in, in, the, in the medical space. And I wonder, Angela, if you could talk a little bit about that um, and, and the behind that and, and, and how those initiatives are, are moving forward. Sure. Um, so when we think about uh, nutrition traditionally over you know the many decades that science has become more and more understanding of how different nutrients work in our body, we think about these things at a very basic biochemical level. We think about one vitamin deficiency results in one uh, particular disease or syndrome. But these complex uh, syndromes that we are now observing in our country and around the world, obesity, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, they're very complex and not, and not uh, at all related to one deficiency resulting in one disease. They're multifactorial. And as a result, understanding that, the science of it, and then training, how do we work with individuals to address those multifactorial components of diseases, which are even more than just physical. There's also the emotional, mental, socioeconomic, these kind of whole health principles of the whole person contributing to that. That's where food is medicine movement is becoming more and more popular. and But there's also various other versions of the food as medicine movement. The core of it means understanding the multifactorial components of these complex chronic syndromes, how food contributes to improving symptoms, improving longevity, or decreasing mortality, or how food can do the opposite, depending on what choices we make. Um, and then training not only our, our workforce and understanding those principles, but also training them how to practically and realistically work with individuals to address their own health. Mm -hmm. And, and on, Emmanuel, on the, on the consumer side, when people are eating out, they're looking for you know, more than just the nutrition from the food, the experience, the sensory experience. Um, how have you seen the demand here in the U.S. changing yeah. during your career and moving towards more healthy options? In my career, I've seen tremendous changes in this country. Uh, I first came to the state when I was a kid, a couple of times on vacation, and I was, being a French guy, we were used to seasonality or small fridges in apartments in Paris, and you only basically buy for the day. Uh, and when I came here as a kid, I never saw that kind of approach. It was more, obviously, supermarket plates, burgers, which as a kid was heaven. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that really was a kind of a culture shock for me and for my family. And over the course of the last 20, about 20 years or more, I've seen that this we are here turning to seasonality. Farmers market are coming up everywhere. Um, I'm going to say something that might be a little controversial, but Food Network, I think, helped a lot with that mentality of Cooking, uh, I'm getting a bit emotional, but working with, with products that people can touch and see and motivating people in cooking at home. Um, I think for me, that was a big turn. Sorry. And um, yeah, I think, I mean, we're getting there. It's going to be a long process. But I mean, at the we have a farmer's market. At the we have a farmer's market. What is we have a farmer's market? It starts with that going to touch the ingredient, looking at the tomato that might not look pretty, but it's so tasteful. I'll pass it. I mean, no, thank you Sorry. For, for, for that and, and, and the, the emotion behind that. I mean, I think that this is you know, what we're trying to recapture yeah. is that connection to not only the food, but the people who've grown it, yeah. the land that it comes from, mm -hmm. and, and seeing ourselves as a part of that, as opposed to just walking in the grocery store yeah. um, and being able to buy 
strawberries every month of the year, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and this global food system that in some ways has done a tremendous amount to improve food security at, at, a, at a very high level, yeah. but has also, you know, had other maybe unintended consequences. Um, and Han, you've done a lot of work around the sensory aspects and the physiology and the psychology of, of how consumers eat food and its effect on them. Can you talk a little bit about that in your work? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, food, what eating is very interesting topic and subject. Because everyone, almost everyone eat, right? And we are very familiar with uh, eating of food. But actually, if you see uh, many different people in many different countries, actually there are many different cultural diversity. Mm -hmm. So for example, when you cook rice, okay, when you cook rice, so uh, how do you cook? For example, in my country, South Korea, we just cook uh, with just milk white rice or brown rice okay, without any kinds of ingredient. Sometimes we add some soybeans or something, but typically we just cook just white rice. But if you ask other countries, people, they add other ingredients, sugar, milk, or other like uh, turmeric or like a tomato, something like that. So they enjoy a different way. And then also when I Googled it, uh, how they cook or how they eat cooked rice, actually I saw many different images from uh, internet, uh, depending on countries. So if you see uh, maybe rice from maybe India, for example, or Iran, there are many yellowish uh, rice because they add the saffron, for example, Iran. And also if you see like a Mexican or Spanish food, the colors will be red. Okay, so, and also based on this, based on this observation, uh, my students and I conducted some interesting study. Uh, we just cooked white wines, okay? And then we just dye, so just milk with different food colorants, okay? We just yellow or orange colors or green color. And then we ask them, we ask a subject or participant to sniff, okay, this cooked rice and I ask them what kind of ingredient, or well, what, what did you smell? When I ask them, actually, even though there are no ingredients <laughs> inside, uh, when they see the, when they sniff yellow color rice, they say, oh, there is some saffron, or there's some turmeric. And then when they smell a uh, green color, oh, there's some spinach, or sweet peas. If they see um, the red color, or reddish uh, orange color uh, cooked rice, they say, oh, there is definitely inside the tomato or there's hot pepper, something like that. So that means actually visual cue, okay? Visual cue and also cultural factors dramatically influence our eating behavior and also experiences. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we look at some kind of food components or eating behavior, actually we need to consider all different aspects to better understanding, to better understand the consumer behavior and specific food perception. So that is my uh, um, uh, my like a uh, discipline and my, that is my way to look at the some kind of uh, food items or eating behavior. Mm -hmm. So also, if you see uh, like uh, eating, so we can rarely eat uh, with any kind of sound, right? So for example, is there anyone who likes eating in silence? No. Or in very quiet environment? Is there anyone? Even quiet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when I had a survey about this, uh, about 3.9% of participants, they enjoy eating in silence when very quiet environment. But many of them, they enjoy eating we're talking with others and also watching TVs and watching something. So they enjoy the eating with some kind of, in the presence of some kind of sound, background sound. So that means also background sound or music clips also can influence our eating behavior and food consumption. Mm -hmm. So based on our, uh, my team's research, also we play on genre uh, when participants eating some chocolate, Actually, jazz genre so increase some sweetness and liking compared to hip hop. So, but this is we cannot generalize this one. But 
because this is just one specific study. But that indicates also we need to consider ambient sound and noise, also background music, when we enjoy food and eating and beer. Okay. So that's why I think uh, eating or food, uh, food eating or food related experience is the best example of multisensory interaction and integration. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in um, whole health, we talk about mindful eating. Yeah. Um, and one of the components of being mindful as you're eating is paying attention to your fullness cues. That has a direct link to the things that you are eating. So the, the hormones that signal to your brain that you are full yeah. have to do with the stretch of the stomach, but it's also a chemical signal. It's an endocrine signal as well. And um, there are different foods that will stimulate that process quicker uh, independent of the volume of the amount of food. And um, mindful eating start with learning to pay attention to your fullness sensations yeah. quietly yeah. Uh, so that you're not distracted. And I know that when I am eating um, in a, a loud environment or eating popcorn while I'm watching a movie or something, I'm not paying attention. Right. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm so full and I didn't even notice that it happened. Uh, so that's a really important component rooted in the neuroscience of distraction, attention, and focus. Yeah. You basically just describe what makes a great restaurant successful, actually. It is, it is truly, it is, sorry, it is truly a full sensory experience. And that's why great restaurants, they hit everything on the head, the decor, the service, the sound, the smells, mm -hmm. and obviously the food. But the food is only just one component of that. Um, I've had the pleasure to run a three Michelin star in France, and there have been 20 years already three Michelin stars, so they didn't need me to tell them <laughs> what to do as far as perfection. But one item that was missing there is the service was very French, which means very stiff. And we were in a, in a castle, so the other things, and a very over-the-top perfect the food was absolutely stunning but the service was so stiff that people were almost afraid to ask anything they didn't feel comfortable first of all the surrounding were grandiose so a lot of people coming from the u.s or from other kind of almost in shock because it was very french <laughs> and then the service was just so stiff so the only thing i was able to teach them is okay relax and enjoy the guests and interact and that was the missing piece and suddenly we saw the guests actually being comfortable, being relaxed, and enjoying their meal even more. So nothing really changed except the attitude of the service. So that's mm -hmm. one of the components. So and and in that spirit, uh, please, if anyone has questions uh, or topics they like to discuss, raise your hand. Uh, you know, wait till the end. Uh, similarly, our online guests, if anything pops up, feel free to let us know, and we can interject those. Um, but you've all touched on on the psychology of of eating, um, and 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 how that um, impacts you know, how much we eat, um, and and uh, what we eat. Um, Han, you've looked at at food labeling and yeah. and its and its impact on, on the. Um, and I wonder if we can talk a little bit about that and 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 your work there, and and maybe touch in these other areas on that topic. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right. Um... So there is the one main question for me. Uh, if you go to grocery store okay, and you look at, you search for your items, food items, and is there anyone who look at the labeling on the packaging? Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah. Any? You got a studio. So <laughs> <laughs> this is good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Not but, a representative sample. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so when I uh, talk with uh, other people, not this audience, our people, <laughs> uh, they don't look at the uh, nutrient uh, ingredient, uh, nutrient label or some certain like, sustainability label, something like that. So they just look at some like a uh, description about flavor or price or brand or other things rather than just uh, specific labeling that related some kind of sustainability or quality of products, right? So uh, my team and also we have some inter interdisciplinary uh, project with uh, researchers at the University of and with other institutions, we conducted some interesting study about coffee. So coffee, if you see coffee, there are also lots of uh, different uh, labelings about sustainability, right? So we 
investigated how these sustainability labelings can affect uh, consumer behavior and their visual attention to the packaging design. Okay. So in that case, um, we also conducted other studies as well over sustainability labelings. So for example, poultry, like a chicken meat, and also other coffee products. But from the multiple projects, uh, I found that um, several messages. The first one is, uh, even though sustainability labeling is very important, okay, but still consumers, they consider other aspects like a flavor or taste or roasting, degradable roasting or brand still or price still import, more important rather than sustainable, sustainability labeling. Okay. So, but this study was conducted in 2014. Okay. Now it's almost nine years ago, right? So now we conduct again, maybe probably the result but based on that result, uh, actually, we also need to consider other aspects to meet the consumer expectation to sustainability based coffee products or other food products. In other words, even though they are favorable for sustainability labeling, so if, if they tasted this coffee, but if they don't like what is not satisfied with their product quality, typically this effect diminished. Mm -hmm. disappear. So that means even though we consider uh, sustainability issues, we also need to consider the basic things, okay? taste and other mm -hmm. quality aspects. So if both meet at the time, mm -hmm. actually there is a pronounced effect of sustainability, sustainability labeling. So it's that, it's that flavor trumps everything. Right? Yes, yes. Price, I assume, is pretty yeah, yeah, important yeah, yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. But even if you want to be the most sustainable shopper out there. If you don't like the flavor, you're not going yeah, back. Yes. Right? Yes. And and what we eat actually changes the physiology of what we taste, right, Angela? There's there's studies around uh um, buds growing to as as whether it be sugar or salt uh, and how that influences what we taste when we eat food, regardless of what's actually in it. Yeah, the, the physiology of taste is probably something we don't really sit around thinking about very often. Um, although I will say that every time uh, you get a cold, all of a sudden you, you don't taste your food very well. That's an example of the highly integrated nature of smell and taste. Um, but smell, taste, sight, and even the physical texture of food, all is rooted in physiology. And these signals that go from our oral cavity, the tongue, all of these signals end up in the brain and the brain is a plastic organ. So that means that it can change and adapt to the continued, continuous exposure to the sensory input that we get. An example of this that we've all experienced um, is the changing sensitivity to sweet taste and then salty taste throughout our lifespan. I uh, have a child and my child, I can tell you, is very exquisitely sensitive to sweet tastes. That child it prefers sweetness over everything else. And that's because they're rooted in proper uh, consuming lots of calories early in life to promote growth. Um, similarly, he's very sensitive to salt. So that means that he, he just doesn't really like salty things. He likes the sweet taste. But as we age, our gustatory sensitivity, our physiology uh, associated with the, the sensitivity by which these taste ends uh, can possibly bind the actual taste receptors, but probably more rooted in the sensory input going to our, our brain uh, can change. So and another example with this is as we age, we actually lose our sensitivity to salt. So my child who can taste salt in any single little bite um, actually, by the time he is my age, it will be a little bit less sensitive. And then we see a dramatic decrease in salt sensitivity past the age of 60. Now, in our lives, this plays out in a number of different ways. One, as we age, we tend to add more flavorings to kind of compensate for that. Um, whether it's spices, sugar, or salt itself, we tend to do that. And that's just kind of a natural phenomenon. But that's important in health, uh, particularly around working with individuals who might have hypertension, or other some sort of salt associated disorders, they have an awareness of the amount of salt or something that they are seasoning their food with. 
And if we can educate, just simply maybe decrease some of your salt intake, but yet still promote the palatability and the enjoyable experience of food through other mechanisms like spices or other flavorings, then you can still get that same enjoyable experience. But it's just something that happens so gradually, we don't even notice it, but yet is rooted in the physiology and the neuroplasticity around taste. To build on that, there is an experiment everyone can do. It's called, uh, you can buy online Miracle Berries, uh, which is either come from a tablet. <clears throat> you put it on your tongue, let it dissolve, and then you can take a lemon and bite it and eat it, and you will taste extremely sweet. Mm -hmm. That yeah. berry basically bypasses or does something to your tongue and your, and your receptacle, and, and it will blow your mind. Whatever, try to taste food, it will literally taste completely different and it totally blows the mind. And uh, we do that with our chefs regularly. Mm -hmm. We try to do that way before service because you don't want to have a chef start yeah, service. Yeah. Uh, the taste bud completely uh, fried. But uh, I highly recommend to do a very fun experiment to do. Um, Emmanuel, I've done that. I, I ordered it online I, and I actually demonstrated this for my students uh, to talk about inhibition of taste at the level of the taste receptor. Yeah. So it actually antagonizes the perception of taste in the oral cavity, but doesn't change the brain. Yeah. So the brain is still functioning and you're interpreting those signals, but the combination of those signals change. And what I did was I, I took it and then I took a sip of vinegar. Yeah. And uh, because, you know, vinegar is very hard to palate. And um, I took a sip of vinegar and I swear it tasted like a lemon lime soda. It was <laughs> sweet and delicious. And I, I drank it. Now don't do too much because you'll make yourself sick. <laughs> I will give yourself a tummy ache. So don't, don't, don't do that. But um, it was absolutely fascinating. That's, that's another beautiful example of that. Yeah. Yeah. And delve too into the, the environment in which we consume food. Um, uh, Manuel, you worked at Twenty One C Hotels, a very uh, you know sensor a sensory experience for anyone who hasn't been. Uh, there's art, there's food, there's uh, sound and music. Yeah. Um, can can you talk a little bit about that work and maybe how things that you brought from that uh, to your firm? It has everything has to fit together. This is why actually you have such large companies like McDonald's that do extensive research on even color the walls. Mm -hmm going towards the red to make you eat quicker and get out quicker or more peaceful. But that's definitely, it was fun that you mentioned that because at 21C um, in the restaurant, we have art that changes regularly. Mm -hmm. And we actually saw the reviews evolve according to the exhibit that was <laughs> present. Uh, we had at times some exhibit, some artwork that was a little bit disturbing maybe for some. And we noticed that we actually took a hit in our reviews, uh, mm -hmm. in qualitative reviews, which is kind of interesting. And then when it was more happy, the art was more happy or explicit, um, the reviews had a tendency to go up. So it was really fun to see because basically the chef was the same, the food was the same. I mean, we were seasonal. So, I mean, you have that, that into consideration, but the decor, the restaurant, the service, the same, but over, the course of different exhibit, we saw the reaction of the public say, oh, the food was less good than before, or it's actually better. And it was the exact same thing. The only thing different was actually the artwork. Mm -hmm. So it was actually very fun to see that. And now on the hotel side, it was exactly the same. Um, at times, art can be political, so that gave an, even a more interesting twist. But that just that little change really made the guest experience very different. Mm -hmm. and, and food companies work a lot on this, whether it's the color of the packaging, the shape of the box. Uh, I think of an example of like kids cereal uh, when the, the characters that their eyes are positioned to look at the, the consumer, uh, the, the child is making the, you know, maybe not be paying for it, but making that choice for that, for that household. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is there... Is there a way to bridge that gap and make that work for health? And will there always be this kind of like junk food gap of, of you know, uh, you see a lot healthier snacking um, uh, coming in onto our shelves, even in the convenience store or gas station setting. Um, you know, uh, have you all seen anything in that in that space that, that you think is, you know, new, innovative, moving in that direction? 
leveraging that psychology mm -hmm. for helpfulness as opposed to just for increased consumption. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it starts with just having the awareness of the purpose of packaging. The purpose of packaging is to sell a product and that's okay. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But having an awareness of what is that messaging trying to convey when you're looking at it and then analyzing, like, for instance, by reading food labels and understanding what the item is, you know, is the packaging matching the purpose of the food? Mm -hmm. Um, and we see this, I think it's easy to give an example. I, again, I, I've mentioned I have a son. This cereal is um, a real thing and uh, it's certainly attractive to, to children, but it's attractive to all of us. And a common, um, you know, kind of a new iteration of this is the opposite of making products look healthier than they actually are. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the, the green packaging phenomenon, if you will, mm -hmm. of, um, you know, this product is a candy bar, but if you just change a few uh, words on the front, suddenly now it's a, uh, a protein bar or it's a health food bar. So you have to be able to have the ability and trained in this because it's not intuitive. You have to really know what you're kind of looking for. And that's part of what um, uh, you know educators across all spectrum, whether you're working with a physician or you're working with um, scientists or you're working with community service advocates or policy, mm -hmm. then it spans lots of different ways to so just bring that awareness to the public. Um, the simplest approach is to, uh, if we can, to avoid the highest processing, highest processed foods that we possibly can mm -hmm. and just go back to real whole foods. Uh, that's, you know, probably the simplest way to go about it, but just simply have an awareness of, um, you know, what are you looking at and what is the product on the inside and do those things actually match up? I also think we are changing as a society and with the growth of chains like uh, Whole Foods, Fresh Market, even now Walmart is offering healthier products too. So I think we are going from a hippie-ish branding of health to a more, it is a part of what you can get almost anywhere nowadays. So I think those companies have also find out that they can do more normal packaging for health. I mean, obviously putting it ahead, but I've, we really have changed, I would say in the past 20 to 30 years. And even now big companies are pushing that aspect and they realize that it is a trend that is not going away. We are moving towards that, so. Any any thoughts on, on what's driving that change? I think uh, the global public perception of what food should be and the fact that we probably it's a big pendulum we probably went too far into the manufactured food mm. over processed extra salty and everything into more of thank actually again to a food network and that kind of stuff because I agree. it really showed a different culture so i think we're basically mm -hmm. the pendulum is maybe towards the middle and medium of that now and you know i think about labeling and uh, this is something we talked about when we were getting ready for this is, you know, organic has a legal definition that is regulated by the USDA and you have to follow certain uh, production guidelines um, throughout the chain from growing it to where it's packaged. And But natural can be put mm -hmm. on anything. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it has no definition. It's a marketing term. Uh, are there are there other examples of that or, or ways in things? Consumers to the average person, each of us as we're in the grocery store or the restaurant can think about what matters, what's important, and, and what is just marketing. I think, uh, first of all, <clears throat> I definitely agree with both of you. Uh, you already mentioned the consumer awareness is very important. So even though we show different labelings, uh, actually the consumer should understand what this label indicates. So maybe education is definitely needed. Right. And also some kind of uh, social campaign or policy uh, being also very considered to increase the consumer awareness of this kind of uh, labeling or information. So, but even though we, I, even though we try a different way how to increase the consumer awareness about the labelings, uh, the passive learning, like uh, just learning the flyer, was the best option. Mm -hmm. So based on that, I think uh, maybe now is the technology is very available. So maybe app, like mm -hmm. a, we have a smartphone, so we can uh, develop uh, some kind of app uh, to screen what, to get some kind of information, what this label indicates. 
uh, specific information indicates. So from that, I think uh, consumers can better understand uh, what this packaging indicates and what this uh, specific labelings or information represent. So I think uh, maybe we can also employ or utilize some available technology, you know, uh, grocery market or uh, dining situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, education. I think about uh, Michelle Obama's Eat Smart, Move More campaign. And, yeah. and now we're seeing kids who went through that, they're, they're now making their own food choices. Mm -hmm. And the way that consumers under 30 uh, make choices is very different from even slightly older and on the other end of the spectrum. So that that education yeah, part is, yeah. is really important. Um, as the Alice Walton School of Medicine is getting ready to start educating the next generation of, of leaders in this space, um, are, are there any uh, other strategies or uh, you mm -hmm. know, topics that, that you think are critically important to for people understand? Yeah, um, well, the overall mission of the Alice Walton School of Medicine is to bridge the gaps to better health um, and to do that together. And there are lots of different gaps that exist between the current state of where an individual is and what better health means to them. Um, so that's that's precisely, you know, how we're working through designing a type of curriculum and, and training and program and offerings to identify uh, the gaps that exist that are more than just the physical body. Um, that, and we have to do that, that is, in, that is extremely important, but there are so many components that contribute to our physical health and overall longevity and well-being, mental health, emotional health, behavioral health, social health, socioeconomic factors. So all of these together constitute the, the notion of, of whole health. And that is uh, part of what we're trying to infuse into our training is to bring those factors back up every single time that we're working with, uh, with patients. So you have a, a mindful awareness of the story of what a person is going through so that you can, in your capacity, help them work through that to achieve whatever their, their health goals are. Um, and that is another important component of identifying what wellness means to all of us is going to be a little bit different. Um, and what well-being is for all of us is a little bit different. And the journey take will look vastly different for all of us. Food is a very important part of that journey because we all need food to survive. And we know the profound impact that food has on our health for positive ways, but also for negative ways. So just infusing that into kind of the standard default way that you think about how people uh, live, their health, their lack of health, their goals, their desires, just infusing that and making that part of just naturally the way that you would talk to someone and get to know them. And and what is available now? Right. Like what is easily The resources accessible. that we all have access to varies vastly different according to our own lives, our access, our availability, um, our experiences, our culture. Uh, that, that makes things, you know, something we also have to be able to address as well. Are there models, whether it be you know medical schools or, or cities or, or anything that you think are doing this really well or have seen you know great impact uh, in implementing this, um, even at the micro level? I mean, there there are uh, lots of initiatives around the country that are working to address the multiple dimensions of all of our health. Um, the, even at the level of the National Health Organization, I mean, there there's huge programs that are working towards this. The, uh, the difficulty is, um, you know, we do have a healthcare system that is fast paced, it's very intense, and um, it's difficult to work through addressing all the different components of a person's health and well being in, you know, the short time that a, a doctor has to work with someone. So kind of translating these big programs into practical day to day benefits for patients is difficult. And um, that's something that, you know, we have to now navigate through training how to how to do that in a seamless way um but yeah there 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 are lots of programs that um are doing this uh but scaling it is difficult yeah if that makes sense can i ask a Please, yes, this, I, I think in, in two points earlier there was a discussion about blue zones which one might yeah. consider as micro regions and so i would like to hear more about what you think about those but also following up on your question that the physician has very little time to talk about it. So what, what do you think it, it should be the ecosystem around us or how could we help grow that in our community 
experts can be co-partners in creating this environment or creating their educational programming or, or you know, all, all around us. So mm -hmm. I'd like to hear, let's just take our Northwest Arkansas region as a small test bed area. And so we'd love to hear your opinions of what might we do, uh, rest of us might do to create this. I think we need to, as you mentioned, we need to see it as a whole. It's a holistic view. And I know in the ecosystem of Benville itself, uh, there was a lot of attention to mountain biking and the trail system to a healthier lifestyle and push people to bike to work and that kind of thing. And then we all realized that it's only one part of the equation and food is another big part mm -hmm. and working with developing a uh, local farm to table system and really starting to push the healthier side of food as well as sports, as well as mm -hmm healthier and outdoor living uh, basically that's where the idea was like basically we're almost describing a blue zone approach mm -hmm. it has to come as a holistic view of the whole region rather mm -hmm. than just food or sports or anything it is truly we have to rethink an area or region at a different level and just uh, on one scale and that's that's a key is to have everyone on board of that general idea mm -hmm. that's probably the most difficult part and just in case anyone's not familiar blue zones are are regions that have uh, longer lifespans uh, relative to the average and a lot of it is attributed to lifestyle lots of outdoors uh active lifestyle not necessarily runners i mean but mm -hmm. and food basically uh a lot of those Blue zones are in in the uh, Mediterranean basins. A lot of them are on actually uh, Greek islands, for example, some uh, Italian islands in Japan, also in Asia. And the lifestyle is definitely they're farming, fishing, and they're outdoors most of the day, and they're not in a polluted environment as well. So it's a very old school, actually. You basically you put your farm and you cook what you just farm or pick. Picked up and um, that produce center. I mean, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Centenary, so, yeah. And it's fascinating because uh, there is actually a good show on that on Netflix about blue zones. You know, we're not all going to become farmers or fishers, uh, you know, uh, but a home garden, a, a windowsill garden, having plants, having uh, time outdoors. These are things we can just incorporate into it. walking instead of driving to mm -hmm. uh, wherever we're headed. Yeah, we may not be able to uh, comprehensively overhaul everybody's life, um, but we can take control of the things that we can control. Um, and even making small changes, research is overwhelmingly positive that just making small changes in reducing the number of, of processed items, reducing uh, uh, just a small amount uh, consumption of processed red meats, reducing some things and swapping them in for healthier choices have profound effects on population and public health. Um, and so it may not be that, you know, I need to start doing all of my own farm to table gardening work, all the herb garden. I love my herb garden. Um, but just simply reducing the amount of salt that I'm eating, not eating as much uh, bacon every single week, you know, just mm -hmm. making small changes can actually have a, a, an important impact on our health. And that's important to go back to the, the doctor patient relationship is understanding is what is realistic for this person at this point in time and what small, what small change can we make that's sustainable and then work on building that over time. It's really empowering because I yeah. think sometimes it feels like Oh, I've got to do all these things. I have yeah. to pay attention. Everything I buy and everything I eat and everything that yeah. I do, it's it's little things that, yeah. that accumulate. Yeah. Really? Usually, you had me up until you said reduce bacon. But... Oh, I'm sorry. Choose <laughs> which little thing you eat. Yeah, for, um, the, the question that I was going to ask, which was a little bit about that, okay, you know, it's easier for me to eat eat really healthy when I have the time to do that, right? Yeah. But like, we all have really busy lives. And I think culturally, right, we just, it's all about how can I do more, more and, and, and more work and, you know, spend more hours. I told Renu that if we really want to do something transformational here at the Institute, we should figure out how to add more hours to the day. Like that was 
but um, but so, so you sort of answered that question a little bit, sort of like you could make just simple choices, right? Uh, but I'd be interested to hear more about, you know, how do we do that? Because, you know, how do we, how do we um, manage, you know, to, to be healthier when, again, a lot of times that, that making some of those choices, um, even just educating yourself mm -hmm. on those, you know, I'm reading labels um, well, can take time. And I think another issue um, that we sort of alluded to and that Emmanuel, I know we talked about previously was affordability. Right. So how do we sort of, you know, tackle those two things um, just in, mm -hmm. in your thoughts? Um, well, I'll give you an example. Let, let's say uh, I'm working with a patient who's pre-diabetic and their A1C levels are, are elevated, their, um, their glucose tests are coming back, you know, concerning. And we start asking about what their diet is. And, you know, uh, it's, it's pretty clear link between uh, consumption of sugar sweetened beverages and, and diabetes and poor health outcomes. So instead of maybe let's do a whole overhaul of this person's diet, how about you just reduce one of your sugar sweetened beverages per day and swap it for water? And that's it. We're just on that for a little bit of time. Yeah. And then we'll take step number two after that and then step number three after that so that it's not so overwhelming that you just feel like you're set up to fail. Um, and that's what you have to have just a little bit of a conversation to understand what can someone handle and what's going to be setting them up, you know, for failure in the long term. And so there's just, that's just an example. And you can do that kind of thing, you know, reducing instead of when you cook a meal, don't add table salt at the table, just put the salt in while you're cooking and that's it, you know, just reduce a little bit of your salt intake. Um, and if, you know, cooking all of your meals all day, every day, seven days a week is too much. Let's focus on just one meal a day. Let's focus on how can you eat a healthy breakfast? And maybe that is overnight oats, or maybe it's something simple that you can grab and eat in the car, but you prepared it the night before. So it doesn't feel so overwhelming. And I, I know that I get overwhelmed feeling like I need to achieve this level of perfection all the time, every day, or I'm going to be in poor health. But really it's about the uh, longitudinal choices that we make that have an accumulative effect over time. Yeah. I think maybe I may add some one of the, my interesting example. So actually, uh, many people in the US, they drink uh, just cold water, right? So if you go to restaurant, uh, I, I, actually I came uh, December, 26, December 27, 2011. So it was very chilly outside and then I went to the restaurant and then they gave me the ice water. So I thought, oh, what is this? <laughs> So in Korea, I, also I studied Korea and Japan. So when I was uh, Korea and Japan, actually they, uh, in the restaurant, they provide like a hot tea or lukewarm, at least uh, tea or water. Uh, and then in European countries, they just provide tap water, like a room temperature water. But in the US, uh, even though you go to Alaska with very cold, very cold area, they provide ice water, right? So based on this, I tried, uh, uh, how the serving, serving temperature water uh, can induce uh, uh, sweetness suppression or sweetness intensity. So uh, we found that the cold water can suppress uh, sweetness intensity compared to room temperature water or uh, really hot temperature water. Yes. If, we so if we just change the, the water, drinking water temperatures in daily life, actually that also can increase our sensitivity to sweetness. So in other words, based on this, actually we can a little bit, add, we can reduce the addition of sugar. So we can reduce the excessive intake of sugar in our daily life. So this kind of one tip uh, to reduce naturally uh, our sugar intake. That is so interesting. <laughs> Not is that because I grew up with normal tap water and I was also surprised with the ice water, but I never <laughs> associated the fact that sweetness was involved in reducing the sweetness because i always thought everything sweet here is way too sweet for me especially in desserts um uh, and you just blew my mind <laughs> ice water hides the taste of the water i learned this when i lived in west africa and the water was heavily bleached so it tasted horrible. The only way I could drink it was with that. It made it really, really cold. And so I wonder, there is somebody, you know, not so great tasting water across the U.S. <laughs> 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 
I even take. I do have a um, a, a question. Um, so, um, you had mentioned Emmanuel that the um, you know, trail came first in our region, and then and then the kind of uh, rope swing. And um, I was remembering it the other way around. The rope swing was one of the earliest entities, but either way, it did predate you know the focus on advanced air mobility and the focus on um, you know. Uh, Technology development, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm wondering about, you talked about the importance of these establishments for quality of life, um, but I'm also wondering kind of the relationship with economic development of a region. And I'm thinking about um, places in South Arkansas, like Monticello or Pine Bluff, where the only places to eat pretty much are um, chains now. Um, have gone out of business, but now there's these new economic development efforts of, of bringing in new food businesses. And um, so I'm just kind of curious. Is about how that interaction between developing the whole, uh, you know, that's not developing connection. Yeah, I basically, 12 years ago when I moved to Benville, that was the case, so it must be changed everywhere. By having some investment done to be different, to open, it was also a city uh, decision. Um, it used to be on the, uh, the BBI, the, the downtown Benville Incorporated, which is work a lot with the city and the main thing was to make sure that the city would not allow chains to be exactly in the downtown so it has to start with that kind of political or view um a consensus of we need to develop something else and then that opens the door to investors to be able to come and open something different mom and pops uh, and those are probably the best driver of a better quality of food because most likely they'll the food from scratch and they'll be also a cultural element. I mean what I'm really truly enjoyed in Benville is to see the explosion of different type of cuisine and restaurants opening with almost from food from all over the world. Uh, and that's fascinating for me and that's also part of the experience and the education on what is good food. Good food is not necessarily just always comfort food. Mm -hmm. But give me a thought. I mean, I mean <laughs> uh, so I think uh, a big part of it it has to be a this local decision of we want to prove what we have. We need to go that way, and then facilitate that. And that's what Benville did, and they were pretty successful with it. And other uh, other towns have done it too. But it really has to be start from the scratch as a global, I mean, as a city level, say, let's agree to, we need to improve. I mean, chains are fine, but they should be limited to where they can be. So policy is a theme we yeah. just heard run through this, whether it's labeling, whether it's development, zoning. Um, are there any online questions that, that we haven't gotten to? Just want to check. We're, we're coming up on the day food is consumed impact our health? Um, does the time of day our food consume impact our health? Um, it, it's a complicated question. Um, there are a lot of factors that go into uh, what regulates our circadian rhythm. So our circadian rhythm is kind of the endocrine control of the peak and then the troughs of various circadian controlled hormones, cortisol for one. Um, there, there are others. So those are influenced by environment, light, rest, stress, sleep. Um, the association between food and, and circadian rhythm is not very, it, in some studies, it, there are shown to be associations, but it's, it's complicated. So I, I don't have a great answer for that. I will say that um, uh, getting appropriate sleep, getting appropriate light exposure, getting exercise um, probably earlier in the day rather than right before you go to bed, those are probably uh, really, really probably more profound in regulating you know your your circadian rhythms and more so than food itself. Um, there was a question earlier. I heard someone ask, "Is breakfast the most important meal of the day?" <laughs> Uh, which is probably what we're really asking here. Um, and, and can I, can I yeah. Yeah, uh, um, you know, I, at the end of the day, uh, our, we're still going to digest our food the same way as if you digested it earlier in, in the day. The difference is if you are going to 
be physically moving around and walking and help kind of stimulating the gastrointestinal tract to help move the food through the system that that will naturally occur if you're moving around and up and awake rather than laying down asleep. But the digestion process itself is still the same. Will it have a big impact on your health at the end of the day? If you eat at 7 p.m. as opposed to 9 p.m. as opposed to 11 p.m.? Not really. Um, it's more about the physical factors of being up and moving around. Um, and then as to the breakfast being, is that an important meal of the day? I think it is. I think it's it's very important. It's when you break fast. So you've been fasting for a lot of hours. You've also been dehydrated if you've been asleep for a lot of hours. So you haven't been drinking liquids. I like to, when I first get up, have a glass of water just to kind of rehydrate myself and wake myself back up. I know I feel better when I drink water before I drink my coffee. Um, and then, you know, the, the macronutrient choices that you select for your breakfast foods, again, just like any meal of the day, we had a conversation earlier about how in our society, we think that breakfast is different. Um, <laughs> somehow it needs to be really heavy in, in carbohydrates and heavy in, um, you know, maybe eggs or that there are breakfast foods, but really just treat it like any other meal of the day and have a balance of carbohydrates and uh, protein and fat. And, you know, you have the best outcome. So kind of what I've, what I've heard in, over the last hour is be mindful, mm -hmm. uh, move, <laughs> yeah. uh, get some outdoor time uh, and, and make at least one healthy choice that you would not make when you're starting to move in that direction and maybe support local businesses. <laughs> Um, we have one question in the back. Yeah. Question. The only thing I, I don't think time of day affects taste, not that I know of anyway. Something that my theory, and maybe Han can answer this, um, is the there are compounds in foods that suppress your ability to taste other compounds. So salt can help suppress bitter taste, for instance. Um, you, we talked about cold can help suppress sweet taste. So maybe it, I, I would hypothesize that the accumulation of things that you are eating throughout the day have an impact, but also it, it's probably more about the things that you're eating simultaneously affecting your taste. Han, yeah. can you speak to that more? Yeah, so timing, Probably will be affect, probably will be affected by many factors. Uh, like, uh, sorry, taste will be affected by many factors, including timing. But I think uh, timing is more important for acceptance rather than intensity or sensitivity. So there is some uh, some scientific evidence about like, uh, sensitivity and some timing of the day. But I think um, we need to generalize. Uh, uh, across the populations and also across the demographics. So I think uh, probably we need to further investigate how the timing affect our taste perception. But I think uh, timing more provide more influence on uh, acceptance or liking of certain tastes or food products. All right, so young researchers out there, that's a new area that needs more study. Um, okay, so final question. Um, what is your either favorite restaurant or outdoor experience in Arkansas? We'll start with you, Mitch. Love canoeing the rivers. Canoeing the river. And making my own sandwiches and picnicking on the shore. It's great. Yeah, huh? for me, outdoor in Devston. Devston. Um uh, Being on the trails. Um, I, love to, I, I like to run, so I love the beautiful trails and having beautiful things to look at while I'm running. Well, on that note, we'll close out. Thank you all very much uh, for joining us today. Thanks everyone for the great questions and for joining us online.